My earliest memory of the Institute dates from the summer of 1955, when I was a zoology student at UCL, taught by an extraordinary collection of scientists, among them J.B.S. Haldane, Peter Medawa, and J.Z. Young. Don Rothwell, who was reading anthropology with a zoology as a subsid, Lawrence Cook, reading zoology with anthropology as a subsid, and I, would walk along Euston Road to the Institute's former home, St. John's Lodge in Regent's Park, to listen to Gordon Child expanding on the Neolithic Revolution and the spread of farming through Europe. I can still hear him saying, start your barrel. <laughs> London in those days of post-war austerity was pretty grim. Bomb sites everywhere, a sort of all-pervading greyness and shabbiness, and St. John's Lodge was equally grey and shabby its Regency grandeur much diminished by years of enforced neglect. And it was the same at UCL, much of it housed in temporary asbestos huts, the last of which disappeared only recently. But to a shy country bumpkin sort of girl from boarding school in deepest Devon, London was heaven. Bungie's coffee bar, theatres, exhibitions, pubs, and running back at night to the women-only student hostel in order to be in by the witching hour of 10.30. <laughs> After leaving UCL, I got a job in the exhibition section at the Natural History Museum and had the good fortune to work on a very un-PC display, The Races of Man, for the great good Kenneth Oakley, him the exposer of Piltdown Man, who suggested I should go away and do a PhD. And about this time, Don Rothwell was working with Eric Higgs in Cambridge, him of economic archaeology and site catchment analysis. I was saddened to discover recently that present-day students have never heard of him. Don had heard that I was unhappy at the museum, and knowing that Eric was looking for an assistant and remembering our trips to St. John's Lodge, he suggested that I might like to apply. I prevaricated until Eric phoned to ask why I hadn't been to see him. So down to Cambridge I went, and was fired with enthusiasm by that solid, pipe-smoking, charismatic man. But it was not to be. He failed to get any money to pay me with. But he suggested that I should go to the Institute and get that PhD. So I trotted along to the sparkling new Institute in Gordon Square to see Ian Cornwall. Almost the only thing I knew about archaeozoology archeo then was his book, Bones for the Archaeologist. Ian was keen to take me on, but said that as he had an arts degree, not a science one, he would not be able to supervise me. He would have to be the Professor of Environmental Archaeology, Frederick Zoyner. However, as he explained, their relationship was so bad that if he introduced me, Zoyner would undoubtedly turn me down. <laughs> Clearly, Paul was not happy in the new department. I would have to encounter Zoyner by some other means. And by the way, Ian said, Zoyner was looking for someone to work on the relationships of European and Indian domestic cattle and their forebears. And, by the way, there was to be a meeting at the Royal Anthropological Institute <coughs> on cattle. So I immediately developed an interest in cattle <laughs> and went along to the meeting. There I met a very confident young woman who said she knew all about the Indian fauna. <laughs> and what was my interest? I explained. Oh, she said, you must meet Professor Zoyner. And she introduced me. The rest followed. Her name, by the way, was Juliet Clutton Brock. <laughs> the Institute, I thought, was a rather genteel, quiet place. Postgraduate institution, part of the University of London, but having little to do with UCL. I was given a whole room of my own. Unthinkable these days. <laughs> so I got the grant from the DSIR and saw to it that I was educated. I went to lectures on European archaeology. I, like Juliet, I learnt to mend pots and bones with the redoubtable Miss Giddy on the top floor, and so on. And Zoyner also took us on field trips. Or at least we would arrive at a famous quarry, only to find no Zoyner. He would arrive late and furious, as I later realised, often because he was ill. I called them Zoyner's tours of the rubbish tips of southern England, <laughs> quarries being much used for that. We went to Swanscombe, of course and many other places, including Braden Forest, to watch the last of the flint mappers at work. The time came to get down to serious work. 
I worked on modern cattle skeletons and bits of Bosporogenius in the BMNH, as it is to people of my generation, the Institute, and many other places. But I needed access to more primogenous material. And in January 1961, Zoina sent me to Magnus Degerberg's Zoological Museum in Copenhagen, where there were numerous skulls, some complete skeletons, and a great mass of material from Mesolithic sites. It was a cold, lonely winter in that dark northern city. But in April, my time there was interrupted by a meeting on archaeozoology at Kiel in Germany, where I saw a very different side of Zoina, disappearing into beer cellars, smiling broadly, arm in arm with his old German chums, or at least those that had survived the war. My understanding is that he turned down the offer of the directorship of the Senckenberg Museum in Frankfurt, not because he didn't want it, but because he had vowed never again to work in Germany. The traumas of that displacement or self-imposed exile were, I suspect, the root cause of his unhappiness and consequent bad temper in England. On my return from Copenhagen that summer, I incurred Zoinder's wrath by getting married without his permission. <laughs> my occasional meetings with him in his study on the third floor were not happy occasions, and he often reduced me to tears. It soon became clear, however, that I needed more material, more Indian material than was available here. I had to go to India. Zoina had worked in Gujarat and had good relationships with Indian colleagues. He made the arrangements with the Indian Museum, and in February 1962, I found myself plummeted into the heat and chaos of Calcutta. After having my palm read by the director, I set to work. Fossils of Bos nomadicus there were in plenty. Unfortunately, some were too heavy to be removed from displays, and since many were hung high up on the walls, this involved working from a ladder, taking measurements with calipers, constructing skull profiles with strips of cardboard and plasticine, and taking photographs watched by a huge, completely silent crowd of tribal villagers with a temperature approaching 40 degrees. Unfortunately, the only zebu skull was in a locked cupboard and the man with the only key was on holiday. <laughs> so instead, I commuted by bus through the back streets of Calcutta to the Bengal Veterinary College in Belgacha, a large peaceful canvas shaded by palms and alive with palm squirrels and minor birds, where to my great embarrassment I was allotted a servant, since a memsaab could not be expected to lift skulls. In those days one could use the plane ticket to stop off. I made the most of that, visiting Kathmandu, Delhi, Tehran, Persepolis, Shiraz and Baghdad where I stayed in the British school and was rowed across the Tigris by a boatman called Hassan. Not quite how one thinks of Baghdad these days. As well as the excavations at Nimrud. Two children and nine years later I completed my PhD. In the meanwhile, Zoina had died, but I like to think he would have been pleased with the results. Ian Cornwall Blessing had written to the university authorities once a year to say that he was sure that my PhD would get finished. <laughs> I got a part-time job at the Royal College of Surgeons, and a few years later, I joined the institute team, excavating in Syria at Tel Nebi Mend, directed by Peter Parr, a lecturer here in the Western Asiatic Department. It's a shame he's not here to tell you about it. My first visit was a study season with the late lamented Peter Durrell, also of the Institute, and Jonathan Tubb. There were 12 seasons of excavation between 1975 and 1995, and one volume on the nearby site of Arjun has been published. The remainder will follow shortly, <laughs> despite its reputation as tell never end. <laughs> Juliet and I were founder members of ICAS, the International Council for Archaeozoology and we were asked to arrange its fourth conference in London in 1982. We consulted Annika Clausson, who had arranged the previous meeting in Groningen. Her advice was no committees. So we went to see John Evans, the director of the Institute, and yes, he said we could hold it at the Institute, and yes, he would lay on a drinks reception. No problem, no charge. We deposited a loan from the Royal Society in a bank where it accrued a high rate of interest and set to work with invitations. 
Glyn Isaac agreed to be the keynote speaker. So many people <coughs> accepted that we had to move the sessions to the chemistry theater, which used to be next door at UCL. Again, no charge. Speakers were made to keep to time with miniature traffic lights. Glad David hasn't followed their example. <laughs> um, and many people remember Angela von den Driesch as the chair of one a session, snatching the microscope, microphone away from a speaker who had dared to carry on into the red. <laughs> the week ended with a hilarious party in Connaught Hall, with Leslie Brent in a kilt, inveigling the guests to join him in a bout of Scottish dancing. Although the conference fee was only 40 pounds, including lunches every day for a week, we made a profit repaid the Royal Society and used the balance towards the production costs of four volumes, Animals and Archaeology. Things were simpler then. <laughs> I've, uh, well, I was going to say I'd overrun my allotted time, but I don't think I have. But, but, but I just want to say there are many people to whom I'm for, forever grateful for the intellectual stimulus and fun of archaeology at the Institute and elsewhere both now, because I'm still associated with the Institute, and in the past, mm -hmm. and foremost among those, is or was Professor Zoyner. Mm -hmm. <laughs>